So welcome everyone to Vegetable Seed Saving 101 and more at the 2021 NOFA Summer Conference. We'll get to introducing our presenter in just a moment. Just had a few announcements to make before we get started. We'd like to remind you that we are presenting, attending, and hosting this workshop from land that was managed and inhabited before European colonization. You can find this map at the link there and we'll also put it into the chat to find your location and give honor to those whose land you now occupy. There are also a few ways that you can center racial equity in your own work. You can assist BIPOC-led organizations, support legislation that will begin the talk and advance the work toward reparations, and work to protect the rights of farm and food workers. Before we begin, just a reminder, while we're here in the session, you're on mute. If you would like to speak, you can press the microphone at the bottom of your screen. But make sure that you remain on mute when you're not speaking so that we can avoid background noise. Feel free to use the chat if you'd like to make any comments or questions and we'll do our best to get those answered. And just note that this session is being recorded. We'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. A number of these businesses and organizations help to fund our conference and NOFA's work throughout the year. So when you have a moment, please visit them through our website or the program book and just let them know that you appreciate their support of NOFA. We also have a live online auction going on throughout the conference. So you can visit this website, which we'll also put into the chat and bid on some items that will also help us to raise funds for NOFA's important work. Lastly, we have a virtual vendor marketplace. In an in-person conference, we have a great marketplace set up where you can visit different vendors and purchase items or talk about services that they may offer. And we've replicated that on our website and we'll include a link to that in the chat as well so you can peruse what these folks are offering. So with that, I would like to introduce our presenter. Today, we have Amy Frances LeBlanc from White Hill Farm. She, it's, White Hill Farm is a small certified organic veggie and herb operation in Western Maine. We grow seedlings for area gardeners and farmers in the spring and participate in their local farmer's market year round. Amy is a lifetime MAFCA member, longtime volunteer at the Common Ground Fair, a member of NOFA Mass, a master gardener, traveler, and an enthusiastic and adventurous cook. Um, she will be stopping at a few points throughout the presentation to answer questions. So please put your questions in the chat or hold them until that point. So with that, I'll hand things over to you, Amy. Okay. Looks great. All right. Well, thank you for the introduction and welcome to everybody who's here. Um, we're a small operation and we're up in Maine in the western part of the state where it's, I've always said zone four on a good day. I think things are changing, so I really don't know what zone we are, but we're on a windswept hill which limits some of the things that we can do. But I still save seeds, some things very formally and some things informally. And I'd like to share a lot of the uh, things that we do and how it all works.
This is one of my favorite pictures. You know, tomatoes, basil, pesto, all the best. In addition to saving my own seeds, I buy seeds in lots of places that offer open pollinated seeds. And I do save some of them, not always. And the, the open pollinated is very essential to seed saving. A lot of the seeds that are advertised nowadays are hybrids. Sometimes you'll see F1 on the name of a hybrid variety. And those are created, literally created varieties. And when you save seeds from them, you will get some strange combination of the parentage of that of that hybrid, not necessarily what you expect. And the, tr the truth is that that can be really depressing. And so finding open pollinated, knowing you're finding open pollinated is really necessary. The uh, most varieties will say it somewhere in the text and every one of these seed companies offers a lot of open pollinated seeds. And one of the things that also happens is that catalogs just don't tell you that seeds can be saved from year to year. And they don't tell you anything at all about how to save your own seeds. And there's this mystique about, oh, it must be difficult. And that's really not true. So um, I'd like to... Um, my slides are not advancing right now. Can you try the mouse, perhaps? It's okay. There you go. It 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 did. Great. So the mystique is out there, but there are some things that you can actually save that are just absolutely simple. And these are the clones: potatoes and garlic, including sweet potatoes are clones. No pollination is involved at all. So successfully storing garlic and potatoes, whether it's dry storage for garlic or a root cellar for potatoes, means that you can save and enjoy the same variety year after year with no issues. And then we get to the, to the discussion of self-pollinating plants. And peas and beans are the ones that are the easiest to save. They truly require some, some extra work if you are trying to make a hybrid out of beans or peas. Uh, there is an interesting process about saving seeds from peas and beans. The plant needs to mature the seeds. The pods need to dry down completely on the plant. And then you're left with shelling them out and you always have somewhat of a mess. So here's my method for cleaning peas and bean seeds. I start with an old pillow slip and I cut one corner off and then tie it shut with an elastic put all the bean mess into that, fold it over and step all over it, squish them good and proper. And then you can open up that corner and out comes the beans and there will be some pods involved as well. And then you can winnow those. You can see the materials flying off to the side. This was using a fan. If you have a good stiff breeze, you can do heavy seeds this way. It's kind of fun, actually. And if you do a demo inside for a class, you can make a mess with a fan. That's kind of fun, too. So we do a lot of tomatoes. And tomatoes are an easy thing to save, but this is where you have to start reading the directions and doing it correctly.
correctly. Tomatoes and cucumbers, and I'll show you some photos about cucumbers too. Um, every seed comes in a little pocket of jelly. And when you open a tomato, you know that. There's the, the seed and the, the gel in, encasing every seed. And in reality, those seeds don't germinate inside tomatoes because they have an anti-germination chemical called allelopathic that prevents them from germinating inside the tomato. And in order to get good, clean seed, we have to remove that jelly. And so here's a series of photos, and it's, it outlines the um, different things that you need to do a good job. This is the hog heart tomato. It's available at Fedco. It's our favorite paste tomato. And an Italian family heirloom with main roots that I save called cacetta. Another one named for a neighbor, Baxter's favorite lunchbox tomato. And so we're gonna talk about care with tomatoes and then that fermentation process. Most tomatoes have closed blossoms and they're considered self-pollinating. But some blossoms are not, and you can see these are open. And that means that these guys can get in and can complicate things. So isolating with something practical like um, tall trellised up peas in between your tomato seed saving project will usually prevent cross pollination. However, sometimes it does happen dramatically. And this is an example. Um, I bought a package of seeds, actually from Burpee, um, expecting to get the plants that look like the ones on the left, which are potato-leaved um, tomato plants. And you can see there's definitely something wrong with this picture. Most of the seeds in that seed packet had been somewhere along the line cross-pollinated and were not correct. So I did report to the company that there was a problem and um, I don't remember what happened, but it took some doing to convince them that I knew what I was talking about. Okay, here you go with the list of things that you need to have in order to save wet seeds. You need to have a jar, obviously, and the cheesecloth is to keep bugs out, uh, fruit flies. It's a gesture. You'll still have some, so you need to keep this process where it's not going to be too annoying. And I did do this just recently, so I admit to buying some uh, greenhouse tomatoes. And cutting board and knife and some place to put the seeds. And then you can scoop those right out and then use the tomato itself for something else. Whether it's salsa or sauce, you know, taking the seeds out doesn't hurt the, that part. And get those into a jar and put some water in it and get it covered up. Now I didn't do this right here, and so this is my failure. I always remind people that, sorry about this, but tomato seeds all look alike and you need to label everything along the way at every step. Now what's gonna happen in a few days is this is gonna to begin to ferment and it's gonna get really ugly and really gross and this will begin to dissolve the jelly that's around all the seeds. And when you shake it up, the good seeds will fall to the bottom. And when that happens, you know that they're ready to clean. And you pour off all that nasty, moldy stuff. 
and fill up with water. And you can see the seeds are settling to the bottom. And pour it off and fill it up again. And eventually the water will be nearly clear and you'll have a nice pile of seeds in the bottom of the jar. And strain it. And we use coffee filters on styrofoam trays and I put the label on there. And when those are dry, right now they're on the top of a refrigerator where, the, um, where there's air moving and no pets to tip it over. And that's also important if you're saving several jars of, of uh, tomato seeds at once because they get pretty doggone stinky. And you really don't want to have pets tipping that kind of a mess over. And I do like to mention that the other variety of seed that is important to save with this wet fermentation is cucumbers. Now I know that cucumber doesn't look like it's good to eat. And you need to keep in mind that we need to save seed from mature fruit. And the green cucumbers that we use for our salads and for pickles are absolutely not mature. So we need to leave the ones that are for seed saving in the garden until they get hard and this dark yellow nasty color they're not good to eat at this point and then the seeds are treated the same way as the tomatoes and when they are free of the jelly they will sink to the bottom just like the tomatoes and you can do the same process of pouring off and then you will have good seeds that look like they came right out of a commercial packet So are there some questions at this point? I don't see any on okay. the English side. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about hybrids again at this point because we're in the process of doing what I call unwinding a hybrid. Back when I said that hybrids, especially first generation hybrids, are uh, a combination of one or three or five, sometimes many varieties. And if you were to grow out the seeds from a hybrid package, you might get a few that look like what you were expecting, and the rest might be something totally crazy. And unwinding a hybrid is a process that involves many years of selecting and eliminating those things that contributed to the hybrid but don't meet your description of what the hybrid is supposed of what the original seed should look like and taste like. So it takes five to seven years to unwind a pepper hybrid and I'm working on a Korean hot pepper right now that I've named Spitfire and we're on about year five and we've eliminated a whole bunch of things that are different shape and a couple that are a different color meanwhile i've been able to select fruits that look like the original and are <clears throat> hot like the original this is another one we've been saving but it's very much a um, an open pollinated one. Its real name is rat turd and they're very small, about an inch long, and they look just like rat turds. <laughs> and this one is Peruvian purple, which is considered to be an ornamental, but it's a very edible hot pepper. And this one is Arledge, which is a Tabasco pepper. We've been saving this one for about 20 years. And this is a good demo of what you need to do to save pepper seeds. They need to be removed from 
the pepper with most of the flesh that you can get out. And again, placed in a warm but dry place where nobody's going to tip them over and label them. Then there's the whole problem of things that are hard to get seeds. And tomatillos and eggplants are the absolute worst. There's just no way to get those individual seeds out. So we take our handy dandy Cuisinart and with a lot of water, put them in, put some of the fruit in, and the good seeds will sink to the bottom just like the other ones that have been fermented. And then you have the seed that looks just like what you got from the from an, from an original package. And that one was one that I saved a few years ago. And actually, it turns out that that one was open pollinated. And we've been growing it ever since. It was the biggest tomatillo I have ever seen. And I bought it because it was a big, huge tomatillo. And we've been enjoying them ever since. Now here we have a problem. And this is where I draw the line for my own seed saving because you have to know what you're doing with members of the cucurbit family. There are several families, four basic ones, and they are very separate and very different but all of the fruits in each family are promiscuous. They're insect pollinated and within each family, cross pollination just plain happens. I'm sure you may have seen something from the compost pile that comes out very strange, might be the shape of a pumpkin but striped like something else or it might be the shape of a delicata, but the entirely wrong color. And this is because you had two different plants in the same family and they cross pollinated in the garden. So there are some strategies to successfully save seeds. One of them is to simply plant only one cultivar in each family. So if you would like to plant butternuts, for example, you should not plant any cheese pumpkins. And since you, it, let's assume you like cheese pumpkins also, well, butternut seed will say, will, will be, you can save butternut seed for five to six years. So you don't have to grow new butternut seed every year. So you can grow butternut, or a different butternut, or a cheese pumpkin, just one at a time, not two in each year. And another example is that if you like spaghetti squash, you can't grow acorns, zucchinis, or those small warty gourds that are so much fun to have for decorations at Thanksgiving time, because they will cross with each other. So again, the seeds will save, you can save them for five to six years and grow them rotationally. Uh, the other option, obviously, is isolation. So that if you have the privilege of using a field or gardens that are far from your property and far from anybody else's, that you can grow a seed crop in a far away isolated place so that no cross pollination can happen. And then last resort, of course, is hand pollinating. Now there are a couple of exceptions. One of them is that loofahs don't cross with the other families. So I usually try to grow loofahs every year. And this is a picture of one that we had a couple of years ago when we had a wonderful crop. 
and West Indian gherkins, the little prickly cucumbers don't cross with anything. And we grow those as a understory mulch in our greenhouse. They crawl along underneath our peppers and our basil plants and we get a wonderful crop for making gherkins every year. Watermelons don't cross with other squashes and melons themselves like muskmelons are another story. You have to be very careful with those. And that's where the hand pollination skills come into play. And I don't usually do this because it requires both practice and um, a bit of, um, yeah, patience. I do a lot of other things and trust other people to do the saving of cucurbits. So when you're looking at your squash plants, you can tell which is which because the male blossoms, like the picture, like the blossom on the left, have no swelling at all. It's just a plain stem. And then on the right is the female blossom. And you can see the miniature baby fruit on every one of them. And these are taped totally shut to prevent any insects from coming in. And then you have to do the hand pollinating like a paintbrush and then close the blossom again so that insects can't get in and complicate things. And corn. Here's um, a question about squash, Amy. Is it okay to stop you? Sure. Uh, someone asked how to save seeds from sequine summer squash. Which kind? It's S-U-C-Q-U-I-N-E. Is that? Oh, I don't know. I'll have to look it up. <laughs> okay, is, it, is it related to something or is this a Spanish name for something that I just might not know the name? That's a good question. There are a few other uh, questions. Should I go back while we're here? Oh, sure. Go ahead. This is a good place to stop. Great. Thank you. Um, so someone asked how long before the seeds could be used? Um, do, can you use them right after drying completely or do they need to be stored for a while? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I think that the, the easiest answer is actually that when things have completely dried. Now, if you go back all the way to the first, uh, to the first photos of peas and beans, how do you know when they're dry enough? So if the seed were drying on the plant, they would eventually drop and eventually they would dry naturally and sometimes you would get plants next year, although peas and beans are not usually planted in the fall. So getting them dried, cured enough is the first step. And then storing them until the right time to plant them is the next step. So the, um, with peas and beans, you should not be able to make a mark on the seed with your thumbnail. You can also use the rather uh, unsophisticated hammer method of taking a couple of seeds and literally just boom with a hammer. And if it goes explode into dry pieces, it's dry enough and safe to store. And then when it's time to plant those seeds, which would in, in New England is next spring, they would be absolutely fine. I do germination testing of all the seeds that I plant. And we do our germination testing in, in uh, January. And seeds always that I have saved always come up very nicely in January. When you're storing um, other seeds like peppers and tomatoes or tomatillos, you need to cure them far enough first. And we usually 
leave our tomatoes and peppers on those styrofoam trays to dry in a warm, dry place for weeks because we're busy doing other things. And then um, when I get a lull in the pickling or in making jams, then we'll take them down and clean them any further if we need to and store them with care. In, uh, I usually use, uh, I use airtight containers. There's a picture at the very end that shows some of the containers that I use. I also use paper and I also use plastic. And seeds need to be stored in nice, cool, and like nowhere's near the bathroom, nowhere's near the kitchen where there's gonna be uh, moisture in the air, and cool and dark place. And we have some shelves in a room on the north side of our house that work out perfectly. And in the, in the corner in the dark in a closet would work out perfectly. And there's, if you look around, and Fedco has a good list of how long seeds should last. If you've dried and cured your seeds all the way and have done the seed saving well, then um, they should last very well for the next year. Or like I said, we start our germination testing right in January. Yep. Thanks, Amy. Um, Heather just clarified her question uh -huh. um, about saving seeds. She said she was thinking with tomato, could she dry some seeds this summer and then dry them and have students plant them in the greenhouse this year? This year, meaning when? When would, would, when would you recommend? Well, I would say that as soon as they're, as soon as the seeds are completely cured and dried, it would be fine. So sometime this winter should be okay. Absolutely. And that just, again, we do our germ testing in January. So that means I think that early planting in the winter and, and hooray for a school garden program. <laughs> Okay, uh, and we got some clarification on the squash. It's a zucchini, sorry for the uh, mispronunciation. Okay, that's okay. Um, zucchini is, first of all, you have to be careful that you're saving only zucchini in that family. And so let me see, where's my, I have a cheat list. You can't save acorns, spaghetti squash, or those cute little warty gourds and zucchini at the same time because they will cross. That, it, it, it just, they just will. So if the zucchini is successfully isolated in some way, then you have to, again, wait until that zucchini is hard as a rock and it'll be as big as your leg and literally hard. You shouldn't be able to crease it with your thumbnails. Just get those thumbnails right in there. And if, it, if it's so hard that you can't crease it, it's probably mature enough. And the seeds are not fermented. It's a dry seed saving. So you get in that squash and you pull them out. And again, then you would put them to cure and dry in a place where there's moving air and make sure you label them. Thank yep. you. Um, there's a question about potatoes. Will you be getting to those? Uh, for uh, Christy, can I jump in? Yeah, sure. Sorry. Um, Amy, I'm just wondering if you could list the types that you shouldn't cross with zucchini. Um, you said acorn. I'm wondering if Christy could type those in the chat. Okay, I can do all four. I Because everything you want to save is mixable. Well, I'll do the, the I'll do the, not all four, I'll do the three. Uh, some people are growing what's called a kusha squash, and that's the only commonly grown squash in one of the families. So I can list the other three families, and then everybody can look it up. The first one, which is where zucchini is, is called pipo, and it's P-E- P-O. 
and that's acorn, spaghetti, zucchini, and small warty gourds. Got it? Hey, thanks. Yeah, okay, the next one is moshata, which is spelled M-O-S-C-H-A, T-T-A, and that family has butternuts, all the different kinds of butternuts, all the different kinds of cheese pumpkins, and kushas. Kusha is a wonderful old heirloom Native American variety, and uh, they're big. Is that a K, K-U-S-H-A? C-U-S-H-A-W. Thank you. Yeah. And then I said that the one family is most Kushas, so we don't need to make a big deal out of that one. And then the other one that has buttercup in it is called Maxima, M-A-X-I-M-A. And that includes buttercup, banana, all the different Hubbards, and turban squashes. And I'll also give you the reference to the book where you can learn all about this stuff and have it right in front of you. Wonderful, thank you. And while we're here, before we move on, I know Christy had a question about um, potatoes. I think there's a little bit more um, on the squash topic in Spanish. Um, so, um, yes, Liana, I, I'm going to see if I can figure out the categories in Spanish. I don't know that I don't, I'm not familiar with them off the top of my head, but I'll look some of them up. Uh, that's why I was hoping to have them in the chat. At least we can look for them. And I'm going to read some of the questions in Spanish and I think Liana can switch to English and, and translate those questions into English as long as everybody who's listening in English has chosen English as their language. Okay, so um, esta, esta pregunta dice, buenas tardes. No he entendido cómo curar las semillas. Espero este mensaje pueda ser contestado. Um, sí. So, cómo curar las semillas. Y voy a pausar. She's muted. Oh, are you not hearing her, the, the interpreter? Okay. Um, it's probably because you're in the main session. Okay, I'll just translate it for those who didn't hear her. Um, so the question is about asking again, how to cure the seeds. Could you just go back to that for a second, how to cure the squash seeds? Oh, okay. Squash seeds are actually very easy because they are a dry seed, even though the squash flesh the, is, uh, is moist, it is a dry seed process. So you need to let the squash get to be very, very mature, past what you want to be eating, and then simply scoop out the seeds and spread them. I usually use a coffee filter because that soaks away any moisture that might be la left. And you can write on the coffee filter what it is. And then we let our seeds sit four or five, maybe six weeks on the top of the refrigerator. I stack up my styrofoam trays like Lincoln logs, just stack them up, stack them up, stack them up. And then they stay for a long time with no problem. And then when they're nice and dry, and you can't crease them with your thumb. 
and you can't break them in half, then it's time to store them away sa safely. Great, and then I'm going to read one more question in Spanish and then I'll translate it into English. Es difícil ver el zucchini madurar, por lo general se pudre muy fácil. Which I think they're saying um, it's difficult to let the, the zucchini like totally mature because it tends to rot really easily. Do you have any tips or thoughts about that? Oh. Rotting things usually mean they're too damp. Um, my only suggestion is a complete reaction to see if the fruit can be lifted off the soil and kept as dry as possible for as long as possible. Um, I haven't had that happen, but I, you know, I'm not the only one. <laughs> Okay, what I'm going to say that, yeah. great, um, looks like Christina has started uh, translating some of the types into the chat for the Spanish speakers. Excellent. Thank okay. you, Christina. What about the potato question? What's the potato question? Uh, this person asks, if potatoes grow little fruits on the top, can you save those and plant them? Aha, good question. Those are actually seeds. And I have found that yes, you can, you can break those open, you can get the seeds out, but you'll get a mixed bag of results. That's not the potato plant's primary um, way of procreating. Um, I'll mention garlic in a moment in the same way. So it's much better to do a good job of storing the actual tuber and replanting the actual tubers. We have a root cellar, thankfully, and we uh, save our, all our fingerling potatoes we have been saving for a long time. And they, they, they grow some sprouts but we go ahead and plant them every spring. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning garlic is that garlic doesn't do a very good job of growing seeds either. And when you are growing garlic sometime in the middle of June, the flower stalks begin to come up. They're called the scapes. And if you I will attest that this is true, although I'm sure it varies from garden to garden. But if you cut those scapes off, the plant then thinks it has only one way to save itself, and it grows the bulbs underground bigger. And I, I have found in my experience that that is absolutely true. However, if you were out of curiosity to let that uh, scape, uncurl and get straight up on the top, it will make a mix of little bulbils, little tiny round bulbils and flowers. And the flowers don't do a good job of making seeds at all, but the bulbils are actually plantable. And it does take two to three years to get a good sized actual uh, bulb of garlic from them. But that's another like Mother Nature has plan A and plan B. And for potatoes and garlic, plan A is the part that grows underground. Thank you. Yeah, the, the question asker mentioned that the potato with the fruits is a fingerling. Yeah. Some, some varieties grow those <clears throat> blossoms at the top and the miniature seed like seed pods on potatoes and other, other varieties don't seem to do it so often. I've got one variety in my garden right now that has the seed tops, so. All right, please continue. Okay, well, we get to the, to the wacko stuff now. This is the, the corn thing and isolation of 
anything for seed saving has to do with either keeping insects out or wind pollination issues. And corn is very promiscuous and it is wind pollinated. And because of that, the isolation for corn for seed saving is a mile to a mile and a half. And if you're in an urban area and your neighbors are growing corn as well, that means you're kind of out of luck. Uh, it is also possible if your neighbors are not growing corn for seed, not growing corn, that you can choose to isolate by timing. We have um, neighbors, I don't, well, I grow corn sometimes, but when I don't, I, we have a communication about corn because I don't want to get in the, in the way of their seed saving project. They have two varieties that they've been saving for years and they isolate them by timing. One of the varieties is very early and the other one is very late. So they are, they're successful with saving both varieties because they're isolated by timing and that works really well. And if you're going to save seeds very seriously and cannot isolate, you then need to do the bagging process, similar to taping the squash blossoms together. You need to do the bagging business to create the isolation. And so the first photo was formal ones, and then you can obviously use paper bags also. I'm, I have a whole series here of photos of things that we save. Sometimes I've saved them by accident. Sometimes I save them on purpose. Sometimes I don't save them at all for a very good reason. So I'm just going to go down through. This is kind of a, a primer on things that are wind pollinated or they're biennials or they're annuals that you do or do not want to make seeds. Uh, chives are an annual and like many annuals when they throw their blossoms the actual edible part of the plant the tender leaves also matures and loses its quality. So if you're wanting to save chives to dehydrate them or to use them in recipes as an herb, you would like to do that before it sets blossoms. And then I use the blossoms before they actually set seeds to make infused vinegar uh, we use white wine vinegar and fill a jar with those gorgeous blossoms. And about six weeks later, we have fabulous chive colored and flavored vinegar. And then I let some of them go to seed because the seed is very easy to save and it's prolific. Now, this is something that a lot of people don't grow. Um, I have traveled for the iFoam conferences, and when I was in South Korea, I saw, this is Lacrimosa, other, it's called Job's Tears. It's basically a grass, and the seeds are fabulous for jewelry making. Um, it was growing outside the greenhouses at a farm in South Korea like a weed. So we have saved the seeds for jewelry making, and because I don't grow anything else like this, we can also replant them the next year. And calendula I use also for infused vinegar, and I haven't gotten into using calendula for making things like hand cream and salve, but 
people who do that kind of, of uh, product grow calendula because it's very sticky and it's wonderful for that. And I like to use orange calendula for doing the infused vinegars. And in the process of growing lots of calendula because they're easy and they're beautiful, I learned the hard way that calendula is very promiscuous. So I've had to very carefully eliminate all the volunteer calendula and plant only orange. And we're in the process of getting it right. So that's one, if you're looking to save seeds, you do have to be careful. I love the yellow ones, but like I said, they're promiscuous. The orange makes better vinegar color. And this is another one that you don't want to go to seed. Like the chives, when the plant says it's time to make seeds, the texture and quality and flavor of the leaves changes because the plant changes its priority from growing a big healthy plant to growing blossoms and making seeds. So this is a good photo showing how you should be pruning your basil to keep it from making seeds. And every time you prune, you get double. So that's a bonus, especially if you make pesto. And then if you do want to let them go to seed, they will very easily oblige and you will get lots of seed. And another one that we enjoy are poppies. And these two are insect pollinated and they're absolutely beautiful. And you do need to isolate varieties if you're going to save seeds. And a little uh, note, this is a nice close up of what's called a bread seed variety. And you can see under the little crown at the top, there's what looks like some places that could be windows. And this is, this is a closed seed head. Many varieties of poppies have actual openings at those little windows. And the wind or you accidentally bumping up against them will plant poppies because the seeds will fly out through those windows. But the bread seed varieties that you would like to save for baking have little closed windows, which is kind of nice. That's even better. <laughs> and again, something that's easy to save. They're self-pollinated, but lettuces are easy to save. Given a hot summer's day, you'll notice that they start to bolt, which is the word that's used to describe the process. And again, when a lettuce plant starts to bolt, the quality of the leaves and the flavor goes downhill fast because the plant has changed its priorities. And the lettuces will get to be one, two, three feet tall and be studded with beautiful little flowers at the top. And you can see all the fluff that comes with those seeds. And I just took, to take this picture, I just took some of those little fluff balls and squished them right in my hand. And you can see the black lettuce seeds. And this is where it's difficult to do winnowing because the seed is very, very delicate. And wind winnowing doesn't work well with lettuce seeds. So what I do is I just plant the seeds fluff and all, and we get plenty of lettuce. Nice close up. And this is one I did by accident. Um, I had okra, I, I tried to grow okra two or three years ago, and it was a big fail. Uh, we're just not warm enough for it to come without some help from the greenhouse. 
And last year, right out of nowhere, I had three okra plants and they were not growing where they were supposed to be. And they were very happy and I was very curious. And so I just left them. And this is what a mature drying okra looks like. And we left them until the plants were dry and it was very brittle and it fell right open and we planted those seeds this year and now that I've figured out how to plant them in my greenhouse they're growing very happily and we are having okra in our soup for dinner tonight. And this is one I'm learning about. I don't know when. This is a radicchio, uh, which we really enjoy as part of our salads. It is a biennial. It's basically a self-pollinating plant, but isolation is recommended. And since I wasn't growing any other radicchio type plants, I'm pretty sure the seeds will be fine. Uh, this is what it looks like right now, today. And I'm going to do some more finding out about when is the good time to collect the seeds from the radicchio. And this is one that I've actually grown seeds for Will Bonzel several times. Uh, it's um, parsnips and they are a biennial and they are very promiscuous and isolation is required. So I just actually cut some of those seed heads this morning and that's what they look like right up close. So one variety at a time or complete isolation. An interesting thing for insect pollinated things. Oh, I'll, I'll wait for that in a minute um, about carrots to describe what they do at Seed Savers Exchange. And this is an onion in a weedy place that got away from us this year. And you can, that's about three feet tall and uh, beautiful blossoms on top. Onions are biennials and they're insect pollinated. So isolation or hand pollination is required. And the flowers are actually beautiful, but you can see the, uh, how com complex those heads are. There are a lot of absolutely gorgeous ornamental alliums. Okay, here's the one I've done on purpose. This is a commercial carrot operation. And they're all tied up to keep them from dipping down on the ground. And this must be isolated. I have no idea where it is. I just happened to find the photo and thought it was a good example. This is one that I grew last year. We have a problem in New England, which is Queen Anne's lace. And carrots are promiscuous. And I have saved carrot seeds by accident and a couple of times on purpose using timing. Because if a carrot is planted in my greenhouse, I take it out of the root cellar and put it in the, in the unheated tunnel. It grows and blossoms way ahead of the Queen Anne slice and we get good seeds. And a single carrot will make a plant that's three or four feet tall and equally three feet around it's astonishing. Amy, can I interrupt you for one second? Yeah. Um, we have a question to clarify a term. Um, can you clarify what you mean by isolation? Literally keeping things away from each other. 
because insects fly from here to there and if they can't get there then you will not have cross pollination and again the wind blows from here to there and if you keep things separated far enough that the wind can't get the pollen to go there then no cross pollination will happen and mm -hmm. isolation by timing literally means that one plant is in blossom and pollinating and then is finished before the other one starts and that's how our grower friends can grow two varieties of corn successfully every year because they do the isolation by timing so yeah, okay and just, yeah go ahead yeah and just to clarify like how do you know which ones to isolate so um yeah i mean i guess it was a little confusing with the squash maybe with corn it's more straightforward how do you know which to isolate okay what you have to do is find out and uh, I do have a reference to a good book to tell you. And there are also sources for that kind of information that uh, you can dig up. I'm going to turn my desk light on, which is going to make me look weird. Um, I have a paper that I downloaded from Seed Savers Exchange just a couple of days ago. I didn't know it was there. It's called their Crop Specific Seed Saving Guide. And all I did was go to Seed Savers Exchange online and ask for their Seed Saving Guide. And we were just talking about carrots. Okay. Across here, they have the common name, the scientific name, how it's pollinated, and carrot is insects, whether it's a biennial or an annual. Carrot takes two years, so it's a biennial. Whether it's a sulfur or outbreeding, outbreeding means, of course, that insects will cross-pollinate. And the isolation distance is 1,600 feet, and that's a minimum. And they suggest that you grow 200 carrot plants in a group in order okay, to yeah. in order to get a good crop of seeds and then the warning column the notes column says crosses with queen anne's lace so what they do at seed savers exchange to prevent all those problems is they have some wonderful wooden boxes well that's just a frame of a box as if you took a pencil and drew a box shape on a piece of paper and those boxes are covered with insect proof no seam proof netting and believe it or not they buy fly maggots from places where you can buy things like fly maggots and they put wow maggots into each box to develop into flies to do the pollination <laughs> it sounds gross yeah. but it's a very practical solution a lot of <laughs> other biennials are saved the same way by isolating in a container or in a greenhouse in some way and introducing insects to do the pollination thank you okay. i'm just going to ask Yep. If Alum or Christina or anybody else um, is aware of any resources like Seed Savers Exchange, but in Spanish, um, if you wanted to put any resources in the chat, that would be great. And I will also look for resources. Thank you. Okay, I have a couple of other things here to share. Um, oh, by the way, that's a fly right there on that carrot blossom. Now that's not me, but I want you to realize that that is one Swiss chard plant. I think that's fairly spectacular. 
and I have grown Swiss chard a couple of times by accident and a couple of times on purpose. And it's pretty spectacular. Swiss chard is a biennial and it is wind pollinated, so isolation is required. And like carrots, you have to be careful that you plan ahead because the plants are literally gigantic. And every one of those little fronds at the top is a complete multiple of hundreds of blossoms. And here's a close up of the one that we grew last year. It was Ford Hook, which is one of our favorite charts and we saved seeds from that and they all germinated i tested them in january and they were fine now in in reality this was an accidental save and we had a red chard as well <coughs> excuse me and they did cross pollinate in the greenhouse but i grew them out as an educational exercise for one of the young ladies who was working with me and um, the isolation worked as far as uh, my controls worked, which was not complete. And here's a list, just a little bit about the different kinds of containers. <clears throat> I like to scrounge up containers, the plastic ones for saving seeds. That lid snaps down successfully. I, I don't think they're airtight, and I don't think they actually should be airtight. And the glass jar in front is that Spitfire that I mentioned earlier with unwinding the hybrid for this Korean pepper. I uh, found the seeds at the H Mart in um, Burlington, Mass, and the package was so beautiful that I decided to try it. And the second year, they were very obviously a hybrid. And so now I'm on year five, and that's the set that uh, we planted. We, we've got several places where we can separate our plants for seed saving, and on the deck is far away from the greenhouse and is far away from my dooryard, so we have three pepper places automatically. And the peppers on the left are that kind called rat turd. And that's what they look like when they're dried on the plant. And I just store them that way because the seeds are too tiny and they're too hot to handle, literally. So we just keep them on the plant. And one of the best things, besides saving seeds for your own use, one of the best things is saving seeds so that you can share them and exchange them with other people. And when I send out seeds, which I sent out five or six packages, and I gave probably 10 or 12 packages to people this spring, past spring, as I always mark them with the name that can be looked up. And it helps if a, a variety can be looked up. And if it can't be, you should, you should find a way to describe it so that you say how long it takes to mature, um, whether it's in the case of peppers, a sweet pepper or a hot pepper or for tomatoes, is it a small cherry or is it a big beef steak? And in the case of tomatoes, because there are different kinds of leaves, like you saw those plant, those seedlings at the beginning, there's the potato leaf kind and then there's the regular kind, whether the plant is a potato or regular leafed kind, because that will help the person who's going to grow your seeds know what they're going to expect to see. And then the year on the package so that like tomatoes will last for seven or eight years very nicely. So I don't need to save apple sweet peppers every year. I would wait four or five or six years to save apple sweet peppers again and have plenty to share in plants. And then I identify myself with my seed savers exchange 
uh, name code, which is the ME for Maine and the LE for LeBlanc and A for Amy. And uh, Seed Savers Exchange actually began with a handful of seeds. This is Grandpa Ott's Morning Glory. And Morning Glories, by the way, will self-seed. They're fabulous. And Grandpa Ott's was literally Diane Whaley's grandfather who said, I've been growing these my entire life and here you need to grow them too. And that's what started Seed Savers Exchange. And here's the book that people should get. If you're really wanting to go beyond just looking it up on the computer and having a good reference book, this is the book that you should get. It's in print and it's readily available. Um, I get a lot of things from Fedco and I know that they carry it. I'm sure that many other seed companies do and it's easily uh, gotten through Amazon, oh my goodness, or from directly from Seed Savers Exchange. And this is where you'll find each crop, how to grow it, where it came from, a bit of history, the things that you need to do to do it, uh, to do it well. And this is where the isolation distances or the self-pollinated or insect pollinated or wind pollinated information will be. So it's kind of all in one place. Now I have to say that Suzanne Ashworth has told me that I shouldn't be able to grow um, things like La Cremosa, like the Job's Tears, but I do it anyway uh, in, the, in my greenhouse, which helps. But it's an excellent resource and it's easily obtained. And one of the things that happens is that you always have some extra seeds and you know, I don't like throwing them away. So this is what I do with them. I make jewelry out of them. So I'm gonna push the stop share and if there are other questions, well, I can't push the stop share. I can uh, help you out with that. Are you finished with your presentation? Yeah, you should, you can do that. My cursor's not working. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. I just want to make a quick announcement um, because the book is in English. Um, Loom did post three different websites in Spanish for people who are looking for resources about seeds in Spanish. So those are in the chat. And if people want to save the chat, if you look at the bottom of your chat screen in the bottom right, there's a little three dot picture and you can press that and it should say save chat. Great, we do have more questions. Um, oh. Is there anything else you wanted to add before we jump into questions? Oh, just go for it. You want me to go ahead and Jocelyn or you yeah. can? Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, someone was wondering how exactly you make your chive blossom vinegar. Any specific ratios? <laughs> okay. Um, I usually use a half gallon jar at a time and I fill it about half full, but I don't squish it down. So it's, it's a lot of blossoms, but I don't squish it. So about half full of blossoms and then we use good white wine vinegar, not cheap stuff, not, not the pickling vinegar, and leave it. My favorite thing to say is in the corner in the dark. <sighs> and I always put the date on so that six to eight weeks later, you have beautiful vinegar to use. We run it through a coffee filter while well, we strain the blossoms out first, and then we run it through a coffee filter to make sure that it's absolutely crystal clear. Sounds delicious. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, we do calendula and hot peppers and fruits and, well, it, lots of herbs, basil and tarragon and chive blossoms and 
there, I'm forgetting some. Blackberries, raspberries, black raspberries, elderberries, aronia berries, um, and I, I sell them at farmer's market in some nice little bottles, so, yeah. Lovely. Um, interested in poppies, so do you have uh, advice for using them or planting them? Oh, poppies, okay. Well, I have various luck with starting them ahead. That's one of the seedlings that's uh, listed as a little bit difficult. They don't like to have their roots disturbed. So putting them in uh, peat pots so that you can just plant the pot and all helps. Some years it works beautifully and some years it doesn't. So this fall, I'm going to plant poppies the old fashioned way by broadcasting seed this fall. And uh, I know because I have volunteer poppies that that will work. Um, I plan to do sunflowers the same way and lettuces the same way. Um, calendula, yeah, there, there's a list. And that's not all of them, but those are the ones that come right to mind. So trying both ways, I would suggest. Okay, it looks like um, someone was looking for clarification on saving tomatillo seeds. I know you had some great slides on that, but maybe just a quick summary again. Okay, that and, and eggplants are the two that are, the seeds are thoroughly embedded in the flesh. And what we've done is to uh, cut the skins off and make sure that the fruit is nice and mature, maybe a little bit past what you'd like to have for dinner, and cut the skin off and put it into a Cuisinart food processor with quite a bit of water and give it a good whir. The, the blades of the Cuisinart won't hurt the seeds because they're so tiny, they slide right by. And then you pour it out and let it settle, pour off the messy water, put in clean water, pour it off, let the seeds, let the seeds settle down to the bottom every single time. And then the same as tomato seeds, when, they're clear, when the water's clear, strain them and then put them on a coffee filter. And again, um, you should save them, let them dry and cure for quite a while. Usually, like I said, six to eight weeks and then the flurry of summer is over and then that's when we package things. Okay, I'm not seeing additional questions unless um, I've missed any, if anyone would like to write any more or speak up. I can add sort of as a postscript that it's easy to start and starting with something that's simple, that doesn't need fancy processing is a really good idea. And once you've gotten started and don't have to buy garlic for seed and you don't have to buy potatoes for seed and you don't have to buy beans and peas for seed, you'll want to do more. And having a good resource and maybe someone you know who knows more than you do, is just, it, it's a wonderful process and it's what that's how farming started, is by saving and sharing seeds. And so we can continue that. So thanks to everybody. It looks like uh, one more question popped up. Oh, OK. <laughs> Can't let you go yet. <laughs> um, how do you package your seeds, in paper or in jars? Um, it's, it's a mixture. I, I have to say that uh, jars take up too much space. And so 
sometimes I just sometimes I just use paper. You can actually get envelopes that are intended to be seed seed envelopes, or you can use just about any envelope or create one out of paper. The only thing, of course, is to be sure that whatever you use, that you have labeled your seed all the way from the fruit through the processing and then all the way to the storage package. Yeah. Good advice. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I, um, I did put a few links in the chat so people can visit um, at their leisure, our auction and our vendor marketplace and a link to um, Amy's slideshow, actually, that you shared with us. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right, thank Thanks you. Thanks so much, Amy.